In a certain way, the puberty of my son Yanni came to its height when he was 23 years old. When he was between 15 and 17, we barely quarreled. He was attending the International School of The Hague, very close by in Kegdine, and I was working in Reiswijk. I actually prepared myself then for challenge, working for one of the largest energy companies in the world, and an easy target for protest. Nevertheless, Jani started to study chemical engineering in the Black Forest area of Germany. And one and a half years ago, in October 2018, he visited me in Düsseldorf, and we went to a theater play together. After the play, we discussed the play, but very, very quickly went into a rift about his shocking revelation that global warming is inevitable. And I reacted in a typical daddy's way. It's not as bad as it sounds. We always found solutions. And I even challenged him, what are you going to do personally? What are you going to do? And that's the reason I'm here. Being here on the stage today is part of my personal journey to embrace global warming and lay out how it can unite us rather than separate us. Every generation has its memories, and these memories shape the generations. Usually they're triggered by pictures. When you see the picture, you know exactly what it means, and you know exactly where you were at that given moment. 1969, the landing on the moon. I was five years old. My parents had a black and white TV. And actually, if I remember back, it's the first television memory of myself. 1981, I was 17 years old. It was one of the largest peace demonstrations in Amsterdam against nuclear armament. The pacifist and neutralist approach of the Dutch uh, peace movement was actually coined Hollanditis, or the Dutch disease. And it led to signing of historic treaties of nuclear disarmament between the West and the East. And the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1989. And all the hopes connected to it of eternal peace. A Japanese political scientist, Mr. Fukuyama, coined it or mentioned the, and called it, this is the end of history. So what does it teach us? Everything is possible if you really want it. Technology can help, and conflicts between people will disappear. So we are the generation peace. And if I look at my generation today, these are usually the 50 to 60 year olds. They're all in key position in society and culture. They're artists, politicians, journalists, judges, preachers, and teachers. And like all the generations before, they're challenged by the following generations. Luisa Neubauer is the face of the German Fridays for Future movement. And let me just read it out. We collectively accuse the generation before us of not protesting and changing something. I was actually very proud when I received the Nobel Peace Prize, but along every other European cit of citizen of the European Union. In 2012, the European Union was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for advancement in humanity, in peace, reconciliation, and democracy. And for me, the most or the biggest achievement is that former enemies kept peace for more than 70 years. During these decades, or the past decades, my generation also went to quite substantial environmental challenges. Let me just mention a few. Maybe you still remember them. The dying of forests and the dying of lakes due to acid rain. The industry was desulfurized and catalysts were put into cars. The depletion of ozone layers, of the ozone layer, aerosols were banned and replaced by safer ones. Poisonous fumes and cables due to PCB replaced through safer ones. Overfishing of the North Sea regulated by quotas. And the war for water in the Middle East, as predicted in the 80s, actually never happened. So what is the first thing that came to mind to like a baby boomer like myself when climate scientists were heard more prominently? I've been there, we've heard this before, we've done that before, and we'll fix it. Even 10 years ago, while working for an oil company, I was very busy with developing scenarios for the year 2050. 
In the year 2050, the world population will have grown from 7.5 billion to 10, so 9.5 billion um, over this span of time. It will reach its likely peak by 2070 with 10 billion earthlings. Population giants like China, Brazil, India will go through their most energy intensive phase at the moment. Mobilization, industrialization. So the forecast is that between now and 2050, energy demand will double. And 10 years ago, I was busy trying to solve how to fill the energy gap rather than solving what happens with the energy and the impact of it. I also asked some millennials about which events stand out. Millennials are usually categorized as humans who are born between 1980 and 1996. And let me just check with the room whether you agree to the selection. 9-11, the attack on the World Trade Center in New York. The global financial crisis. It started with the collapse of the Lehman Brothers. And then many lost their jobs, many lost their money. What did it teach this generation? Don't trust anything. Behind a shiny facade, there might be disaster. And I'm giving you a prediction, 10 years out. In 2030, when some of you will look back to 2020, which picture comes to mind? The world sometimes needs special people in special situations, and this time it might be greater. Hopefully that raised some childhood memories with you. <coughs> Let me take you a little bit into my childhood. I grew up next to a steel plant. My parents still live there, nearly 100 yards away from it. And as a young man, as a student, I used to work there uh, to, study my, my, uh, to finance my studies. It was great pay, not so nice working conditions, and emission-wise, maybe also not perfect. Then I went to Berlin, and sitting class in microeconomics, I was introduced to two gentlemen, two, two Englishmen, actually. The first one, Ronald Harry Coase. He was born in 1910 and awarded the, piece, uh, the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1991. He used a lot of steel plants and fishermen to show his cases. And let me just describe the situation. Both parties use the river. The fisherman to get his catch and the steel plant as cooling water and also to release waste. Nobody owns the river, therefore using water comes for free. What happened, or what happens, the fisherman will catch as much as he can, he might even overfish, and the steel plant will produce far more steel than necessary because the water doesn't have a cost. Ronald Coase now proposes property rights as the solution. And property rights should lead to a negotiated solution where the cost of, of using and polluting is part of the cost equation. So let's just apply that to this example. Let's assume the fisherman owns the river. So the fisherman could go to the steel plant and he could say, you can give me money and so you can pollute the river to a certain extent. And that money should be far more than the loss in catch. Now we take the other example. The steel plant owns the river. So the fisherman would go to the steel plant and say, can you pollute a little bit less and I give you money for it. And that money should be lower than what you could get as additional catch. So at the end, we find a social optimum with no intervention of the state. The second Englishman I'd like to introduce you to is Arthur Cecil Pigou. He was born in 1877. He was the first one to describe external effects. External effects are exactly what I described before, using a good, damaging a good without paying for it. In his book, the Economics of Welfare, and it was published exactly 100 years ago, in 1920, he proposes a tax. And the tax up to now are usually used to fill up the coffers of the state. His approach was different. He said, let's evaluate the damage which is done to the river, and I apply this as a tax to the people who use it. We also use the income to subsidize good behavior. Does that sound familiar? This is the theory behind CO2 tax. 
and subsidies for electromobility. Let's apply this to our little example here. The fishermen would, text, would be taxed for every fish he catches and the steel plant for every litre they use. The fishermen would catch a little bit less, the population of fishes can grow. The steel plant would use, uh, produce a little bit less steel and the water stays cleaner. And why am I telling you that? These are two economic theories. I have the impression rather than talking about the tools and how we can use these tools and ideas, we are still bickering about whose fault is the mess we are in. So let's go that route a little bit. I give you a certain angle now whose fault it could be. This is actually CO2 emission historically to today. <laughs> Any surprises? Actually, the Netherlands come number 19. But does it really help? Does it really help to blame maybe the number one position? Does it tell us who's actually having the highest CO2 per capita consumption? Does it tell you who invests the most to reduce CO2 reduction? Does it help to blame the baby boomers and put the millennials or Generation Y into the victim corner? Why actually are we using descriptors like baby boomers, millennials? The reason is our brains need filters to process data, incoming data, otherwise it's overwhelming. Jorge did a, told us a great story about our ancestors. And I'm just picturing our ancestors walking the plains. And they need patterns. Enemy, friend, sheep, <laughs> lion. The downside today is thinking in boxes leads to prejudices. And I'll take dietary preferences as an example, because it was also asked in the invitation, what dietary requirements do you have? Vegan, vegetarian, and let me call them carnivores, <laughs> the meat eaters. Usually mutually exclusive choices. And you probably sometimes overhear the bickering between them about my choice is the better one and discounting the other one. It also helps to be in a box, sometimes helps to satisfy two very basic social needs. Number one, sense of direction. I know exactly what good looks like and I know how to behave in a certain way. Sense of belonging. I do exactly as my, my, my peers and I'm part of something. And now comes global warming. Global warming is the challenge of our times. It might lead to disruptions, and it might lead to farewell to very long-trained habits. It also has the opportunity to bring us all together because now we have a common denominator, CO2 reduction, more or less in whatever I do. And boxes can become sliding scales. They become a continuous axis. And let me just demonstrate that in a graph. Yeah, you see the preferences of dietary requirements, but a carnivore can stay a carnivore even if he, meets, or he, if he eats less meat, but he moves along the CO2 axis. A carnivore remains a carnivore if he doesn't eat, eat beef anymore. A vegan remains a vegan even if he buy, doesn't buy tofu anymore from a far distant country. So everything becomes a continuous or a continuum. Let me introduce a second axis to that. Means of transport. From bike, trains to planes. In our old world, box thinking world, <laughs> we could create new boxes. And I have to apologize to my three children because I'm using them here. There's my younger son, he's a flygetarian. He's a vegetarian but he still likes to use planes because it's faster. Famous Yanni, who I mentioned in the beginning already, is a car gan. He's a vegan, but he uses a car. And my daughter, she's a bikevore. So she eats meat, but she bikes. Now make this even more complex. A third dimension. Let me call this your room climate preference. 
You know, thinking in boxes becomes very, very silly. It's almost impossible to plot a fourth dimension. But think of use of electronic gadgets and the power required for this, for storing, processing, streaming. And then we can add even more dimensions to it. So at the end, whatever you do is a little point in an n-dimensional space. And it's your, your private CO2 footprint. Therefore, with CO2 as a common denominator, we have the opportunity to overcome the differences between generations and various lifestyles. And we can unite behind a common goal, reduction of CO2. I showed you some tools, like the PIGU tax. It's now the CO2 tax. Sweden has introduced this long time ago, and Germany just very, very recently in last fall. In this approach, we also still have one more choice to make. How do we communicate that? How do we get this across? And we can become policemen or clergymen. We can focus on trespassing, on sinning, pointing fingers. And we can become coaches or doctors, encouraging the right behavior, leading by example, and also accepting that we are far from perfect. And I can also choose to be coached. And I have to say a very, very great thanks to Yanni. He didn't even know the content of my speech today. And he really made me change my, my, my thinking. So thanks really for that. At the end, every gram counts. I live now at the River Rhine. And if I walk along the river, what do I notice? Parts of the steel plant I used to work in have long stopped. Other steel plants are applying the most stringent regulations and emission controls. Yanni is a vegan, he doesn't even need a fisherman anymore. And the river is left to its own equilibrium. Thank you very much.